mid-century modern house overlooking the field house and my office view of the fountain. But far more valuable is the opportunity to work with and learn from faculty colleagues who have given their professional lives to this institution. I do think Bethany College is unique in the way that it has historically recognized all of us who work here as educators. Bethany College is built on the idea that we all advance the learning of our students in so many different ways. In the classroom, Yes, but also in the library, in the learning center, the hallways, in the cafeteria, dorm lobbies, the pool, the fields, the pitch, and the gymnasium. No one epitomizes that all-encompassing commitment to the teaching and learning that formed the mission of Bethany College more than the two colleagues whom we honor today. Professor John McGowan came to Bethany in 1980 and served the college for 40 years. He taught more than 24 different class titles at the college, he served in many other capacities as a coach, an administrator, and a teacher. In fact, he served at various times as head coach of four different sports, swimming, cross country, track and field, and women's soccer. He made a great and underappreciated role, uh, he played a great and underappreciated role in bringing women's sports at Bethany College to the varsity level. Over the last three years, Professor McGowan has been compiling and writing the history of women's sports at Bethany and in the pack, and we all look forward to hearing more about that work today. In May 2020, he was named by the Board of Trustees to the title of Professor Emeritus of Physical Education and Sports Studies. Professor Jan Forsty served Bethany College in many different ways and roles for 34 years, from 1987 until 2021. Her career at Bethany actually defies belief. When reading her list of accomplishments, it's difficult to credit the idea that one person could have coached multiple teams in different sports to almost 20 pack championships and the third highest total for NCAA Division III softball wins. While teaching hundreds of Bethany students in over 20 distinct courses, chairing the Department of Physical Education, serving at Bethany as associate and acting athletic director, not to mention the fact that she was the first female athletic director in the state of West Virginia, colleges at any level. Um, her classes were memorable and widely praised. Her advice and mentorship have been cited as transformative in the lives of many, many Bethanians. Some of them in this room, many of them hopefully watching us today via Facebook. 
and her reliability and devotion to others in our community is unparalleled. In May 2021, the Bethany Board of Trustees accorded her the title of Professor of Physical Education and Head Coach of Softball America. I don't need to tell you that these are two remarkable Bethanians, but I would be remiss if I did not conclude that I have been honored to count them among our faculty and even more honored to count them among my dear friends. I know that you all are here today because they've been true friends to you as well. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Emeritus John McGowan, Professor Emerita Jan Forsty to deliver their shared last lecture. Sports, women's sports, and oh, 
but both. And this has been the challenge of Title IX legislatively, because when you get a proportionality and stuff where you want to try to equal things out, 130 football players, there isn't a woman's sport that can, can match that. So that's been a lot of the struggle. Another challenge, I saw this with the 1976 Yale, one of our prestigious institutions in the country. The Yale uh, crew team would go down to the river to crew. The men went then to the locker room because they were wet to change clothes, shower, and leave. The women got into the vans wet and had to go home. There was no locker room until they challenged the law and then got a locker room for the women. Uh, just a couple of the cases. Hayford Temple uh, helped give a strong direction to college um, athletics by regarding budgets and scholarships that started to come around for women, uh, mostly with the participation rates with men and women, which is proportionality, which gets very complicated. The one I like to talk about is uh, Franklin versus Wynn School District. This was the first time where somebody could sue and get money if they won the Title IX case. Prior to that case, you just filed a complaint and it didn't go anywhere or you didn't get anything for it. Uh, 1976, the NCAA and its infinite wisdom uh, challenged Title IX instead of embracing it. And I'll get into a little bit more on that. One of the most important cases with, was with Rose City, one of our sister schools in the PAC. They uh, said, uh, no, we're not going to do that. And you can't make this because if you know anything about Grove City, none of their students get uh, scholarships from the college. And they're also very, very cheap to go to. So they challenged it, and they actually won. So the Grove City v. Bell in 1984 kind of put a big stop in what Title IX was trying to achieve. Um, by the way, I want to mention you know, to my Grove City friends, they had a phenomenal women's athletic program. They didn't do it because they needed more women's sports or opportunities. They did it because of the Grove City and they felt they needed to challenge it. Um, the Civil Rights Restoration Act in 1987 did reverse the Grove City v. Bell uh, institution and restored Title IX's institution-wide coverage. Uh, any program or activity would then be covered under Title IX uh, and they actually then found out by pursuing the Grove City kids, uh, they didn't get money from the school for scholarships, or, but they got financial aid. So the federal government had the financial aid that uh, triggered, um, triggered Title IX back for us. Three-pronged test is what's been used in the past mostly to assure um, Title IX compliance. Again, it gets very, very complicated. Um, Proportionality is the big one. Uh, what happens with proportionality is a lot of institutions will have, say, 55% um, female population, 45% male population, yet the men have 75% budget and the women have 25% budget. So what proportionality says is you need to try to get as close as you possibly can to the percentage of student population. Okay, uh, so it's a budget thing again. History of continuing practice. If you look at Bethany College, the only, well, we added women's lacrosse. Prior to that, the newest sport that we added was uh, women's soccer, which John coached. So we have not had a history of continually adding sports. Okay. Uh, full and effective accommodations goes through the list of 12 things locker rooms, travel, you know, if you have a tutor for men's uh, sports, you have to have a tutor for women's sports, so there's a whole checklist. But this gets very, very complicated in a class in and of itself. Now John's going to take you to the next part. All right, uh, first of all, I have to give you some idea of my research. I did not research Title IX at all. What I researched was this banner has been hanging up in the, the Hummel Field House since, I don't know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And if you notice, we have 12 women's championships. In the, when I started this study, um, there were only four women and one coach who were in the Hall of Fame from that period. Now, as a coach who's coached, I first started coaching in the 60s, I don't know if go there. Um, uh, you either win because you're a much better coach than they are, or you got better athletes than they are. There's an old quote about uh, Bear Bryant that he can win with yours and he can win with his. 
you know, it doesn't matter because he was a great coach. There has to be a couple of women who were good athletes on those teams. <laughs> but the problem comes up with there's no stats. But, so that was my research. Now, the other thing about my research was, it wasn't a research project. It was a fact-finding thing. I was just going through there. So I didn't really cite stuff that you might if it was a scholarly research. What I did is I looked uh, in the tower, I looked in the college archives, uh, I looked in whatever I could find, yearbooks and things like that. Now, I don't want to demeanor what happens in the yearbook and the tower, but that's basically a laboratory experiment for our communications kids and stuff like that, so that students learning how to do stuff. So sometimes they're not as accurate as they could be. In all my years of coaching, there is a, rarely that I get someone call me up from the tower or the yearbook and ask me about stats or anything like that. They usually didn't go to the cross country meets that were away or the swimming meets or something like that. They asked one of their friends who was on the team what happened. And as a result, we have some conflicting results that were in the paper and even in college stuff where I've seen different records for the same team at the same time. And so what I had to do was make my best guess of what I thought really might have happened. Uh, also, we didn't have good statistics. Uh, if you look at John J. Knight's information, he had it in a ledger that was handwritten that is falling apart and sitting over in the athletic department, I think. And when one coach moved, they often didn't put the, their stats there. For example, I have uh, a file cabinet full of swimming statistics, okay? And if I leave, who get, someone wants to fill, empty that to fill up with their statistics so they get lost. Once we got the computers, we did much better. By the way, I'm gonna go through a lot of these things because I grew up teaching uh, with, originally, you assigned a chapter, and then you came in and talked about it. But then, as we got later on, no one bought the books, so they don't read the chapter. So I used to put everything I could on these slides, so at least they could see that. And so I'm gonna fly through some of these things and just hit different things. So, um, I'm also gonna try and get some, so this might not, I've probably talked through this already, uh, but, uh, so I'm going to go through some of these slides and just hit on what I think might be important points to see what happened. Uh, I'm not going to go over that the basketball team was 3-3 three and three or something like that. I'll have it up here. I'll have a slide at the end of each year of what the records were and who uh, the significant seniors were. At Bethany, we have uh, senior plaques that you get after you did for four years, and they have different things that they put on them. Okay, but not everybody got those, and sometimes you would, if you're a multi-sport athlete, you'd fill it out for basketball, and then you played softball in the spring and didn't refill it out because you already got a practice, so we don't have everything on it, but I, I'll have those. And you'll notice that in the early years, there weren't a whole lot of people that I have that for because, in, for example, in 1974, no one played varsity sports for four years because they only had it for two. Okay, so you'll see, and you'll see the difference in the number of articles that were done and the number of things that happened. So, I have to give you a little perspective before we go on. So this is the world in the 1920s. First of all, 1920, women finally got the right to vote. Okay, uh, Antwerp games, only 65 women in the games. Uh, they only did archery, tennis, figure skating, swimming, and diving. 24, at the Paris Olympics, they dropped archery and figure skating was switched to the new Winter Olympics that went on. In 28, uh, the team event was added in gymnastics. There were no individual awards. They just put all the scores together. Uh, five track and field events were held. The 100 meters, 800 meters, four by one, the high jump, discus, and javelin. And those would be the only sports for women in summer games until 1948 and additional sports were added. So from 48, they added canoeing, 56, mixed equestrians, you could be on the men's team, okay? It, it wasn't, you know, if the woman was good enough, she was on there. Uh, 64 was volleyball, and in 68, mixed shooting, okay? Uh, now, there was a big controversy on the 800 meters in 1928. Uh, and basically, 
uh, they talk about before this time, women were supposed to be protected because they were delicate, because of the chivalry type idea from the elite gentlemen and stuff like that. And uh, they thought, the medical profession thought that physical exercise was dangerous for women and that too much effort would uh, harm their reproductive organs. Okay? And then uh, in looking at this controversy they had, basically the administrators of the IOC and the media decide that women uh, are too frail to compete. Uh, and as a result, they removed the 800 meters from the game. And from that point on until the 60s, the 200 meters was the longest event the women could do, okay? Uh, so here is one of the reasons why the women were eliminated. They, it was, I guess you would call it propaganda, okay? Uh, one of the reports of the event said that 15, 11 women were in the final, five women dropped out before they finished, and five collapsed after the race, okay? Uh, however, if you go back to the photographs, if you go back to the results, First of all, there were only nine women in the final. All of them finished. Three broke the world record, okay? And, oh, by the way, uh, the world record at the time was 219.6, and they went 216.8, 217.6, 217.8, and for comparison, Nina Wilkie holds our school record as of last year, and she's only born 100 years too late because she would have been right up there with the, the people who got the medals. Uh, but, uh, if you look, this is the start of the race. There are only nine there. These are the results, okay? As you've seen, if you've gone to a track meet, if someone breaks a world record, if you look at what happened at the last Olympics when they did some fantastic results, some people fall to the track afterward trying to catch their breath, okay? Um, I will show you a graph later on of the irony of the fact that women get closer to men's competitions the longer it is, okay? So actually women are better in long distance events compared to sprints, but that's, anyway. So 100 years ago, we started the Women's Athletic Association, and basically what it is, is to promote athletic activities among women, to give athletics their place, they rightly deserve the life of every student, athletic ability, sportsmanship, high academic standing. And basically, we wanted better womanhood involving physical, mental, and spiritual fitness and so we'd have a better America, okay? Uh, if you ever see, get anything from me, I talk about this wrestler that you might know of, uh, well, uh, um, from his wrestling name, a guy uh, who said that back in ancient Greece that uh, God put together physical and education together to make a total thing. Um, I think you guys know him by his wrestling name, Plato, okay, because he was a wrestler. Uh, that's what he's famous for. So then, uh, the interesting thing in 1925, this is basically a pre-Title IX complaint, okay? And basically, uh, what they were declining in their interests. Why were they declining? Because the variety and the challenge of their activities weren't very much, okay? Every, uh, the plan was to have two years of required uh, work and one year of theory, and the Women's Athletic Association would be the recreational side of physical education by taking charge of all the intramural sports, okay? Now, the classes were a two-hour physical education class, which was gymnasium work. They talk about the Swedish gymnastics. Basically, you're talking calisthenics, okay? And for some reason, and competitive activities were offered were inter-class basketball, baseball, tennis, and swimming. Now, for some reason, that since the only closed games were permitted, and they saw no other goal besides having that activity, like you want to win, you com your competitive urges, anything, weren't realized. And so many of the girls wanted more than just that taste of athletics. They wanted to do more, okay? Men, on the other hand, had baseball, basketball, track, field hockey, I'm sorry, um, football, and they could go out for athletic teams, okay? So if the guys didn't have a team to go out for, would they have done the stuff? Well, why can't the gals have it? Um, according to what happened at the time, the women had to study from eight till nine, and after that they had to be in the dormitory until the next morning at breakfast. The guys had none of that. They could do whatever they wanted. 
so the gals were really restricted. Okay? And by the way, the only woman on the staff in physical education was let go in those two years. So maybe there's a correlation there. Okay? Um, also, in 1934, they started doing these play dates. Now, what's play dates? Basically, they brought women together for the uh, socialization, okay? Like guys going down to play basketball and, and, you know, and just get together and let's just have some basketball and have a good time. Uh, well, that's basically all they did. They talked about the milk and cookies uh, because after the game, we'll have milk and cookies uh, to socialize. And they wanted to uh, avoid some of the abuses that the men had, okay? Uh, by the way, uh, for those historians in here, Helen Louise McGuffey is in two of the pictures. Uh, for those who don't know, she's a rather uh, well-known former professor forever at Bethany. Um, and basically, uh, they, women in 1954, they started competing against other teams, much like our club teams play other club teams uh, in there. And they got to use Irwin Gym. What's Irwin Gym? That is the Grace Phillips Johnson Visual Arts Center. Okay? And it was very small. Okay? Uh, and this is just, I'm skipping through this to catch up because we've got to get a whole bunch of years in here. Uh, so basically, uh, the teams were basically more club teams, not varsity teams, although they would be called varsity. Okay? And basically, as we get to the 50s, we're getting back to the quote. The fact of the matter here is that the girls actually wish to more than just a taste of athletic. Um, their performances were not regularly covered in the tower. I could not find a whole lot of tower information before Title IX. Okay? And in the yearbook. Uh, so finding stuff, schedules, things like that was extremely hard or not possible. Uh, now, the notable exception to the recreational type stuff was in the late 60s, Carol Hunter. Okay, Carol Hunter uh, started to compete for the men's swimming, uh, track team, the tennis team rather. She was the first woman to compete in a PAC men's ten, uh, tennis competition. And in, during her first season, she and her brother, she captured the number two singles, and with her brother, they caught, captured the number one doubles. Uh, for the next couple of years, she did very well. She was in Facing the Crowd in Sports Illustrated, and she was the first woman in the Bethany College Hall of Fame. I did not count her in those four women and the one person because this was before Title IX. This is not, she was on the men's team, and you'll see that. Uh, years prior to Title IX, uh, the field hockey team was coached by a student, and uh, so uh, they had four uh, games, uh, and then the men, women's volleyball team played, coached by the same student, and they had five scheduled, but uh, they lost two, but no other results are covered anywhere, okay? They also had a JV team, so they had more. Okay, I'm gonna pick up speed here. Okay, <laughs> women's basketball was mentioned in four articles, but not much covered, uh, and the, basically, they're talking about they're playing California State, that's a much bigger school, Okay, uh, they, they didn't get much coverage. There were three articles versus six for the men. Uh, and basically they didn't talk too much about anything that were happening, okay? They talked about maybe the women played here and they did this thing, that. Uh, they didn't get much coverage at all. Uh, and the only fall article was about field hockey and tennis. The tennis team, switched from the spring to the fall, and I want you to look at uh, Glenda, Glenda Ford. She was the number one singles on the women's team. We'll come back to that when we get to the title after the title line. The only uh, picture in the yearbook was girls volleyball. It was under organizations, not sports. Um, 72, lack of awareness. They started seeing that. Uh, uh, in the field hockey game, they, two games was in the first sentence, and then the next paragraph wasn't much about anything else. Uh, budget, women's had a five-game schedule, uh, no formal league, no team rankings, few spectators, 
The only time Kilgore is mentioned in Coward at all. That's the only time. Uh, girls in winter sports, uh, five won another game, and, that, and two women were trying to start a varsity swim team, but conflicts with the men's swim team was a problem. Uh, and you'll see that again when we get to other things. Um, uh, men's tennis team comes up, and Lena Ford is winning the number three single. She played on the men's team rather than the women's team, which was still offered at that time, probably because she had better competition, more opportunities, more and more things. So she, and she was good enough to play. So she's one of the people like, how come she isn't in the Hall of Fame if she was number three singles playing against guys? So, um, so that just tells you that. Um, uh, practice time. Uh, okay, tennis, one of the problems they had is they got to practice three days a week at 7 a.m. Okay, if they moved to the other season from the guys, then they could get the courts all the time. Okay, uh, so we go over and that type of stuff. So, there. Ready? <laughs> 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 As we know, that's a challenge for Coach McGowan, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> he did well. Um, the section, I'm going to talk about my personal side of, of Title IX, away from the law, what it was like to be a young girl um, growing up in the 1960s and beyond in athletics and what bridges we had to cross or walls we had to climb to make things happen. So I'm going to break it into three sections. Uh, before Title IX was, actually it's going to go further back than 68, is my high school years. And then my college years was the beginning of Title IX, though you wouldn't recognize it. And then um, after um, my college career goes through teaching at a high school level, and then at Wheeling College, and then um, up here to Bethany. So just a breakdown. Um, so this is before Title IX. This was in a, a high school. Yes, that's me. <laughs> okay. Um, dug it out of the closet someplace. Uh, when I was in high school, the only sport they had was golf. And at that time, I wasn't interested in golf. I am very much now. Um, so I became very interested in music. Uh, I played clarinet and alto sax, jazz band, uh, French horn in the orchestra. I was number one seed. Uh, in, in the band. Actually, I was second clarinet last seat in my ninth grade year going in, and then I discovered that you could challenge. Well, of course, his competitive side kicked in immediately. <laughs> challenge? Which challenge was going in another room playing the exact same piece of music as somebody else, and the band voted. So midway through my freshman year, I was at first clarinet, first seat. And I thought I was going to major in music. That would have been funny, wouldn't it? Um, then I discovered this round orange thing that bounces my sophomore year. They started women's basketball. When we had women's basketball, please understand that there were six people on the court. Again, back to John's thing that we're too delicate and our uterus will fall out if we run too much, which was believed at the time. So you had two forwards, two defenders, and two rovers. Well, the two rovers on my high school team was Jan and Jan. We were 5'5", five, five, and our other defense. So basically, basketball for us, my sophomore year, was four on four. Because the defense would run up and stop at the midcourt line and go, I can't go over that line. And then the offense would be two, two forwards, you know, and, uh, and the rovers. Sophomore year, no uniforms. We wore blue jean shorts, white blouses, and a penny. And we won a tournament in Mount Alberni. We were very, very good. We didn't know we were good, but we were very, very good. Um, six on the court. Our parents got very involved at that point. I always say that the best thing that can happen to Title IX compliance is for all the football dads in the world to have all daughters. <laughs> because trust me, if their daughters are not getting a fair chance to play, the parents will get involved. And ours did. So junior year we had uniforms and we went five on five. Um, we then added my um, Senior year, they added uh, tennis and softball, so I, I got the chance to play all three. Prior to this, though, I did want to let you know that um, I did go out for Little League, okay, in 1963-ish. 
Uh, best kid in the neighborhood. I had all boys around me, so that's who I played with. Um, went down to try out, went through the tryouts, and my dad's best friend, Chuck Faxendall, came up and said, uh, sorry, Tian, I have to send you home. Why? I'm good. He said, well, I'm sorry, you're a girl and you can't play. I wish I had more fortitude back then. Because it took some other women later on to raise that up and say, no, I do have every right. And women, girls now do have league, little league play, which they didn't, didn't before. Um, just some quick facts here, you know, as far as 1972, uh, only 7% you know, of the uh, sports were played by women, 93% by the boys. Very, very, I just put that in to show the, the wide gap that we had. And yes, that's me shooting a foul shot. <laughs> It was, yes, I did. If you look real close, it's halfway down the basket. <laughs> um, after high school, I graduated and uh, decided to change my major and not go into music because I never learned how to play piano. I thought it was really hard for somebody to play piano or not play piano and be a music major. So I went up to Slippery Rock State College, which is, was nationally known at the time for a great physical education teaching program. It was a normal school, as they were called back then. I thought that's a, that's good. Actually, I chose it and applied to only one college, and I got in there. But I chose it because I did go up and see a women's basketball game there, and there were awesome, awesome women that were playing very competitive sports. And I went, oh, I got to be a part of this. So I ended up going up there. But when I got there, Silver Rock only had four sports for women: tennis, volleyball, basketball, and track. Uh, so I went out for ball or basketball because that was my high school sport. You know, I had fallen in love with it. So I get up there, there were 124 women trying out for the team. Now you cannot tell me that women don't want to play sports when you have 124 women trying out for one basketball team. Uh, I made it down to the cut of 24, practiced for a week or two with the team, and uh, Ann Griffith came up and said, don't need guards this year. So she cut myself and Addie Malatesta, which is interesting because I ran into her later in my career up at Allegheny. She was the athletic director over uh, at Wilkes College, Eastern PA. So we both ended up, even though we didn't make the team, we became very successful. So I played tennis um, again. That's me playing tennis, by the way, if you notice. I have long hair. <laughs> I didn't think anybody could imagine that, so I had to do it. Overall, with tennis, I, uh, we only played about nine matches a year. Again, again, not a full slate like the men's teams had. Um, I am in the Hall of Fame at Slip Rock for tennis <laughs> for all, all 36 games. So, <laughs> um, Again, uh, before Title IX stat, what about the effect on uh, professionals in colleges and universities with Title IX that came around? Again, that's me. Um, how are we going to create athletic opportunities for women in this setting? A um, bunch of women got together and decided that we don't want to join the NCAA because we feel that they do everything wrong. There's corruption. There's problems. So what they decided to do was create what's referred to as the AIAW. It was created in 1971 and did defunct in 1982. It was about 10 or 11 years. Created by women for women, created championships, held sectional plays, created more sports, did a wonderful job for all of the women's sports that, that were needed during this time with the AIAW. Um, once the women's basketball in particular and the AIAW started to sell tickets, started to become very famous in what they were doing, um, money talks, folks. The men in the NCAA went, hmm, money. I think we might want to get involved with women's sports. We're not going to give them everything, but we're going to get involved so that we can get some revenue from them. So the NCAA, I can remember when I was athletic director down at Wheeling College, you know, we had a women's program, it was the AAW, and we had uh, the men's program in the NCAA. So it doubled the budget because teams were going in different directions. and the male athletic directors at the time said, well, we just need one organization, so you know, we're going to scrap AIW and everybody's going to go NCAA. 
And that's kind of what happened with the women's sports along this. Again, I just threw some uh, facts down there just to highlight some of the disparities in the percentages. So again, before Title IX, it was okay for women to play delicate sports. I think John alluded to that. Uh, figure skating, gymnastics, the ones that you really like in the Olympics all the time that are prime time, because they're considered delicate sports that women should be able to play. Not masculine sports. Team sports were considered masculine sports. Um, and we've got some real masculine sports going for women now in the 2020 era, for sure. Uh, before that, John alluded to play days. I was part of a play day. Drove my competitive side nuts. Because we would load a bus at Franklin Regional High School, we'd go off to Plum High School, you get off the bus, you weren't with anybody from your high school, they divided you up for social gatherings to play different sports. And then you got to back together for cookies and milk. <laughs> did not feed my competitive side. We also then, before AIW, we did have the GPWS. Three, you're very familiar with that, aren't you? It was the first, it was the division of girls and women's sports out of the uh, APER Association that started a lot of that. Uh, again, the AIW uh, goals were uh, equality for women, created by women, for women. Um, we've kind of lost that, the, the NCAA has adopted us somewhat well. My first teaching job right out of uh, Slipper Rock State College, I worked at Chartres Houston over in Houston, PA. Um, that's me. Um, just to throw some personal touch, that's my softball team uh, back then. <coughs> physical education became very, very different after Title IX. Uh, I can remember in my physical education class, first of all, you wore a little, I'll call it a onesie. Becky, is that about right? The onesie. The jumper type thing. Uh, and there was a divider in the gym. Women played on one side and men played on the other. Title IX brought about co-educational physical education. Oh my God, do you mean women and men lying together, they might touch each other in physical contact? Well, the guys might not have liked it, but the women loved it because it, again, increased the competitive side of what we wanted to do and to get better. And as John said, you know, we did get better. The more we played, the more opportunities. We did get much, much better. Uh, third title line was my coaching days. I started at Sharp Jersey Houston. Uh, just so you know that um, I was hired at Sharp Jersey Houston to coach uh, softball, volleyball, junior high basketball, intramural director. <laughs> the baseball coach coached baseball. <laughs> this is kind of a theme for my life, isn't it, Joe? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Wheeling College, I got hired to coach volleyball, softball, I was assistant basketball coach, coordinator of women's athletics and intramurals. Some of you now understand why I'm having trouble sitting in, around in retirement not doing anything, because <laughs> I'm used to doing a lot. Men's coordinator at Wheeling um, ended up leaving uh, due to a uh, rules violation. So at that time, Fred Lambert turned and said, well, change your coordinator of uh, women's athletics. Uh, your men's athletic coordinator, like, what's your name, you athletic director? And I just went. I don't think he realized, I mean, what he did at that time. Uh, I got calls from all over the country. You're the athletic director? Yeah. Can I interview you? Sure. This was 1986 that I, that I ended up taking it. Um, so you can see that there were many, many things. Oh, and then Bethany, I, um, I was hired as a field hockey coach, softball coach, plus uh, an instructor in the physical education program. And then, uh, as Joe alluded to, I've put a lot of different other hats on my head for sure. What was different about Bethany? Well, when I got here, uh, the softball field, Diane, I think you remember that. Uh, chicken wire, backstop, grass infield, Becky, right? And uh, we had uh, two by eights uh, uh, telephone poles that were cut off to sit on. So I came in and they said, you're softball coach, and I said, well, okay. Uh, I will only take the job if you get that damn grass out of the infield. Uh, oh, but it helps it drain. I said, it also causes a lot of errors. <laughs> so we've done continuous improvement you know, on, on the field. Uh, scoreboard dugout is, is an interesting story. Uh, Guy Johnson was going to donate dugouts for baseball and softball field. And uh, so Joe Curry called us in and said, okay, Rick, I want you and Jan to get together and decide what you want. And I said, well, yeah, we will. Well, 
I knew exactly what was going to happen. Brett Carver went off and did all this research, okay? Came back, and I knew Joe Curry, God bless him, well enough that we sat in the office. What do you think Joe Curry did? Hey, Rick, what do you want? Rick laid it out perfectly, what he wanted, materials, size, justification. Very good, Rick, thank you. Jan, what do you want? I want what Rick's getting. <laughs> that's title nine, isn't it? Yeah. That's title nine. Scoreboard. It's not the one that's out there now. Is the same one out there in the baseball field? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's massively huge. Uh, softball had the same one. Again, Rick, what do you want? Jan? Same thing he's getting. That's called getting equal treatment for both, both sports. Um, there you go, John. Did I say this? All right, so now I have to do the 50 years of, you know. So anyway, okay, I've got to give you a little idea of what happened with women outside to give you what's going on inside. So to the, basically, and I guess sociology go with this, Rosie the Riveter changed a whole bunch of stuff for everybody after World War II. And women got more involved in things. <clears throat> so. Uh, in the 70s, the expectations that women wanted were much different than they were before. For example, in the 68 Olympics, if you look at gymnastics, it was, had a lot of dance movements in what they're doing in the floor exercise and the balance beam and all this stuff. If you look at 1972, Olga Corbett started doing backflips off the uneven bars and doing some of these things, and she started doing more athletic type things, and that's changed women's uh, uh, gymnastics completely. In the 1960s, in swimming, women were thought to peak at about 17 or 18. Uh, in the 1968 Olympic team, only two women were over 18. There were, and I think there were only two 18-year-olds, by the way. Uh, and there were 20, uh, the other two were 20 years old. In the 1972, nine were over 18, and two were 22 years old. 1976, nine were there, and the oldest was 23. Now, why did all of a sudden these women not peak? Because they got to swim in college, on a swimming team. Um, for those who don't know, we had a woman who qualified for the Olympics at 40 uh, a couple years ago in swimming. So it's, it, and now we have women who are, Katie Ledecky graduated college a while ago. Okay, she's still women, why? Because she makes $2 million a year. Okay, Michael Phelps on that one because he was making he, he was making like five million dollars a year. Okay, so because they had the advantages to do things, all of a sudden the peaking didn't happen. Okay, the women didn't like having their hair wet going to prom, so they would quit after that. Um, just to give you an idea, going back to what we said with the 800 meter thing, here are the world records, men to women, and basically the women are about 90 percent. But if you look as we go up here, okay, as we get to long distance things, they're more than 90%. If they go to marathon, they're 90, more than 90%. So maybe the women are better at the distance. Now, if you also look at this, this is the world record progressions. Do we notice what happened from uh, the 1920s when people started doing stuff, and then as we get to the 50s and 60s, okay? If we look at this one, again, the same thing early on, and now we're down to here. So those are showing that, given the opportunity to practice and do things, the women are becoming more and more similar to the men. Will they get, get equal as far as athletic performance? Uh, probably not, but uh, it, as I used to tell the kids, if you look at a normal distribution curve, some uh, countries might have a our, our races might have better quality, you know, the best time in the 100 meters run, but that is the best. If you look at the normal distance curve, most of the people, sorry, most of the people from that race and any other race are probably very similar because they overlap. It's only the extremes where you really get the differences, okay? Um, I don't think I could beat Super in a one-on-one, -on -one, okay? I think she's better than I am. Uh, so, uh, after here, uh, we went from the club stuff to more of the um, varsity teams. So the athletic department kept better records, 
Stati and, um, statistics, the athletes were out, uh, be on, get varsity letters, senior plaques, teams had conference schedules, end of season tournaments, conference championships, all conference teams, and possibly go into regional and stuff. So all of a sudden, they had these opportunities. Okay? Uh, this is basically, we became, we started in the spring of 20, of uh, 72, which is only the summertime came before we started it. Now, the Athletic Advisory Committee came up with four sports for the women. They had, whoops, sorry, uh, field hockey, volleyball, basketball, and tennis. And they would be coached by Miss Reed and Miss Hatter. These are women who grew up, their professional time was in play days. Okay? That's what they did. Okay? And they did they tried to do the best they could. I'm not saying anything like that. By the way, the men only had ten sports compared to the women. Okay? Uh, so media changes weren't drastic. Most of our decisions were based on budgets. Okay? The faculty members here understand that 110%. <laughs> okay. Women's field hockey had five contests scheduled, two ended up being canceled by the way. Well, uh, basketball at six, women's volleyball at seven, women's tennis at five, okay? Basically the same as the year before, nothing really changed. Uh, first women's contest was field hockey, they beat Waynesburg 10 nothing, okay? Uh, and they finished the season three and up. They finished the season three and up, that was the whole season, okay? Uh, and uh, the guy Wright came out for the swing team. She was the first woman on the women's swing team. Realized that there were only, at championships, you were only allowed 18 competitors, okay? So in order, and for regular meets, you only had 18. So in order to get to meet, she had to beat some of the guys, okay? As a result, they didn't get on too many, into many meets, so oftentimes they ended up quitting because I practice all the time and I get into meets all year, okay? Uh, volleyball, same number of teams, but they had an A and a B team, uh, you know, which I guess would be Marcy and JV. So they ended up doing get more because they took the people who didn't play the first game, they played the second game, which is not really changing the game much. Uh, and basically, now we're starting to get more in-depth coverage with statistics that they didn't have before. Before they said the girls won. Okay, now. Uh, we're getting much shooting percentage, what they get from the foul line, things like that. Um, I'm, uh, Lena Ford was the number three singles player. Okay, I wanted to mention her again. She all um, and um, in the yearbook, women's basketball team was there, but they didn't have any field hockey team, volleyball team, or tennis team. Men's cross, which was a club sport, had two pages. Okay, why? Because. My friend was on, you know, I'm working on the, at the yearbook, and my friend, it's my friend, or me, okay? So, I'm gonna go, these are just what happened. Now here, um, we're just going over that they're improving. They, Bethany, field hockey, for the past 10 years, the athletic director said this, uh, have been very good, and, and they've been in varsity sport the last two years. Next year, we're gonna get up to nine games. Big whoop. Um, now, the women's swimming team now has four women, Beth Bolton, Ruth Zeffenbach, Marion Scollins, and Lainey Damon, okay? What you need to know about that is, at the PAC Championships, Mary Ellen Scollins placed sixth in the 400 IM. Oh, that was one of the participants of that, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, seventh place, she won the consolation in the 1650. Oh, that was one of those distance events, wasn't it? Ninth place in the 200 fly, that's one of those longer events. Okay, Beth Bolton was ninth place, uh, in the 400 IM, and 12th place in the backstroke. That made, they were two of the three women who scored at the men's swimming championships. And again, this is in the conference. They, they don't have a women's conference, by the way. We still don't have it. Uh, they lost a game against West Liberty because the different size of the basketball court, okay? They were tired running around because they were on a bigger court, okay? Um, this is, Grace Phillips Johnson Art Center. That is the running track around the top. We have the basketball court. How many people have been to Hurl Center? Do you notice that the back court line is halfway down to the other one? Okay. Well, basically, it's the same court. And in the basement, they had four lanes of a swimming pool. Okay? Uh, 
Um, so, the girls uh, would, would taken over by the athletic department, so they would now going to start using the alumni field house, okay, for what's going on. Uh, now, Glenna Ford ended up being captain of the men's swimming track team, tennis team, rather, okay? Uh, but she's not in the Hall of Fame, because she's probably not very good. Uh, uh, and there's no mention in the yearbook, again, no women's volleyball, no tennis, and lacrosse still has some people, the guy wants to really, really like them. Okay, this is what happens with them. Now, here is the first person who has a senior plaque. I'm not, I pick these people only because they have a senior plaque. I'm not saying they're better or not, but if you notice what she did. Okay, I also have that she was a varsity field hockey player, and she was the um, test, number one test player for the women. Okay, 75, we get an increased number of things going on. The women have eight matches and stuff like that. Um, and this is the first year that the women's tennis team got uniforms. Okay? Um, and the women's teams were moving from Urban Gym to the athletic field house. And now, practice schedule had to be staggered. We, guys go afternoons now, girls night, next week, flip flop. Uh, I believe that's probably the same today. Um, it was while I was coaching. Um, now, women have changes because now we talk about the, uh, the DGWS rules, we've changed to NCAA, so change of 20 minute halves instead of eight and 30 minute box. Um, women were starting basketball in February after J term, okay? Guys started playing in December. When I first was hired, this fall season ended basically at Halloween, and you couldn't start winter practice till November 1st, no contest till December, and we finished basically President's Weekend, okay? And then spring couldn't start till February 1st, okay? Um, but <clears throat> the women probably didn't get to stay over Christmas to practice. Most of the time, they were playing their first game, and this was Marietta's last game of the season. Who is in better shape? Who is more structured, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, by the way, if you notice, we were playing teams that are much bigger. Oh, notice how some of these people are starting to pick up some, how many people are involved here, okay? Uh, I'm gonna flip by here, so somewhere they will get out. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I'm just going to flip through some of these uh, to try and get what we get to the big thing. Uh, Leslie Benson might have been the first woman uh, in track and field, but I'm not sure because she was in a picture, okay, but not on a roster. And as some of you know, like they take the pictures first day of practice, and then so and so quits, and they don't play anymore. And, so we, I, I don't have any record of her ever doing anything, okay? Um, Dave Hutter was hired, and this is in 76, I believe it was, and he, he had a significant influence on how women's sports happened at Bethany. Um, uh, again, uh, here Angie is, I skipped over, Jean uh, was hired in the Hall of Fame, the first one, uh, in 2021, that was after I started this. Angie, who is, her husband is on board trustees, um, is a second one uh, from that era we made there. Um, 1977, Bethany women have a conference. What does that do? We now have conference championships. We have all-star team, you know, all conference teams. So now, they could have stats. Before this, I, we couldn't get in the Hall of Fame because we had no stats. I mean, let's look at the men's football offensive linemen. How many are in the Hall of Fame? Not many, why? Because the only stat you have is when someone sacked the quarterback, okay? Running backs, they get all the stats, okay? Quarterbacks get all the stats. So now we can start getting it. Sally Dorwart was hired. She brought a new modern philosophy of athletics for women. She played in college, okay? That changed about, by the way, she was the one that um, is the, the one coach that's in the Hall of Fame. She had, was most of those 
seven, those 12 championships. Um, by the way, in the conference that they played, and they played all these teams, four gave scholarships, seven did not, so we played scholarship teams. Um, first conference championship, uh, and uh, one reason we did well with the women, Sally coached both of them, they played, September was field hockey season, and they'd win. October was volleyball season, they'd win often with the same people, okay? And then they go in, and then she coaches in softball. I want to get up to that, I'm gonna skip ahead. Uh, except that one more thing. Anybody know who Dick Road is? Pirates, you should know today. Yeah. Okay. Um, His daughter was on men's golf team, okay? Mm -hmm. And played PACs, and she was uh, captain one year, okay? Um, and when I go back, back to back championships, uh, I have to skip ahead a bit. Uh, and I want to go to all conference players and stuff like that. We started getting these stats. Uh, I want to skip ahead to um, uh, into the 1980s, actually, way ahead, to um, we started women's soccer. Okay, women's soccer. The, we weren't, the uh, athletic committee said we shouldn't have it. Why? Because basically, we joked around when I was as cross country coach, we used to talk to called Ben the, the Minnow, because basically it was a three hour tour. Where do you play? Basically, three hours from wherever we are. Well, in those three hours, we had no Division three schools. No one in the conference would go and play soccer. Okay? Uh, the closest we played Denison, um, and that was after two days of practice. We were winning at 1 nothing. Uh, and at halftime, and we lost three to one. Do you think you know, fitness had anything to do with that? Um, but we canceled, we said no, because there was no one to play. We ended up playing club teams and uh, NAIA teams. Uh, we were very successful the first year, I have to get up here way farther. Um, and what happened was, uh, between the first year and the second year, we did well the first year. Second year, we didn't do as well. And the Seton Hill game is something that comes to mind. We had beaten them 6 nothing the year before, and we lost 3-1 to one the next year. There wasn't a woman on the field from Seton Hill who played the year before. They were all on scholarships. So we went down. It was only uh, later on when women's, uh, so when the PAC picked up women in the late 80s, uh, that they started soccer for the women, okay? Uh, and um, that helps out. I want to finish up with uh, when the PAC started, they started with just women's basketball one year, then they went with um, next year, we, we picked up things. A lot of the women's sports that we picked up, we picked up because women joined a men's team and we didn't change the coaches, we didn't change the budget, we didn't change anything else, we just had more and more women come out. And that was in swimming, that happened in track and field, that happened in uh, cross country. Uh, soccer was the first one that we joined up. So, sorry it took so long. <laughs> First of all, with the heat in this room, thank you very, very much for sticking with us. But we're going to go through just quickly a few more things about Title IX um, that I wanted to share. We think that we've achieved a lot, and we have since Title IX has been enacted. But we're not there yet. We have the problem that just happened in the 2021 uh, NCAA Women's Division I Basketball Championships, if you remember what happened. A young woman took a picture of the weight room that the women had. This is a little pyramid of weight. Compared to the picture of the men's weight room, which was an entire room this size filled with weights. Her speaking up and taking the picture to social media changed that. And this is what's starting to happen in this day and age, where people are starting to speak up and show proof that Title IX is not done 
that we still have roads that we must plow down to achieve the equity. Uh, only 80% of college athletic programs are in compliance with Title IX. What? Yeah. They're not in compliance, 80%. You think Bethany is? Not going to. Uh, what about the 1999 Women's World Cup with Brandi Chastain taking her shirt off? I can't believe she did that. Oh my God, what would a woman do that? Well, guys do it all the time. They got it all and slide on their knees and whoop, whoop, whoop. You know, they just won the biggest tournament of their life. Of course she's gonna celebrate. But that was the first, one of the first times that we actually saw <coughs> teen sports for women successful. 1996 Atlanta Olympics was the first true women's Olympic Games in my mind because it we won things in team sports that we had never won before. We've always won dainty sports, but we hadn't won that many team sports. So that became very important, I think. And it, as John said, it's because we started training girls earlier to be successful. Uh, what are some of the positives overall of Title IX to, to try to bring this to a close? Well, it opened the door for educational opportunities for women. A lot of Harvard and Yale kids or schools did not accept women into their schools till Title IX. So it opened up educational opportunities through scholarships. Uh, 2021, more women competed in the Olympic Games, or 2012, in the Olympic Games than men, first time, and they won more gold, more gold medals, which was amazing. Educationally, it changed things educationally. Pre-Title IX baby, I never got to take shop. Had to take home ec. Learned on a sewing machine, which I pretended was a race car. <laughs> Step on the pedal and put the fabric through. That was my right, you know. But I couldn't take shop. It wasn't permitted. Now they can. Stopped expulsion due to being pregnant. Many schools would ask girls in high school, if they got pregnant, you have to leave school. Uh, stop some of the educational stereotypes. Guys are good in math and science, right? Aren't you? <laughs> uh, girls are good in literature and some of the arts. Stop a lot of that. Cons? Eliminated programs. And this is one of the things that people uh, comment a lot about Title IX. Well, it's going to eliminate men's sports. Look how many wrestling programs have been canceled. Let me say this very clear. Title IX does not cancel sports. Title IX does not cancel sports. Administrators who can't fund their budgets correctly and reallocate funds to keep all their sports cancel sports. But male athletic directors in the beginning would blame Title IX. Well, we're going to have to cancel uh, you know, wrestling because I have to bring softball on. No, no, you just allocate. I always say, I've said this in my class, why does WVU football on a home game stay in a hotel with one or two per, per room? Trust me, women's teams put four in a room most of the time. Couldn't we take that money and use it to fund a tennis team for women? Um, funding allocated poorly, sexual assault has been increased, and I know most of the students in here said, you know, when we talk Title IX, they go, oh, sexual harassment, here we go again. Uh, as Jerry Stebbins has done a very good job of educating on that. Well, that's part of Title IX also. Remember I said Title IX doesn't men mention women, it doesn't mention athletics and sports. Uh, taxpayers end up paying for failures of Title IX. There was a lawsuit down in Florida where a professor, um, she, She, she sued uh, for sexual um, discrimination and won a case for like $19 million. And that didn't come from, the, it was a state institution for a state university, so the state ended up paying, paying for that. Um, increased injuries for female athletes. I know John McGowan has spoke over and over and over about the, is it the triad? Yeah, yeah. Uh, ACL. ACL injuries for women athletes has increased. Some of it's anatomical, some it's because they're not trained properly, and we're still catching up on that. Uh, eating disorders um, have increased. 
um, with with the sports that we've had. We could have talked forever on Title IX. For us to have crammed it into just about an hour, John, congratulations. <laughs> uh, we did it. There's uh, John's going to take all of his research that he's done, and he's giving it to Heather or Tui, where were you were here. There you are. Um, to, so if you want to know more about the history of the, the women's athletic programs at Bethany, he's very thorough on that. Um, that's my sources. Um, we both have our original emails here at Bethany. hasn't changed. We get to keep them forever. Uh, so if you need to contact us uh, for whatever might need to be contacted for, please reach out for Title IX or you know, just about anything. Like I said, we couldn't nearly begin to cover everything, and I, and I thank you for putting up with the heat and sticking with us as long as you did. Thank you. Thank you.